Hello there and welcome to Reduce Headaches, the Residential Remodeler's Guide to Contracts. This is a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. Thank you for joining us today. We have a few administrative items we'll go over before we get started. This presentation is protected by US and international copyright laws. Reproduction, distribution, display, and use are strictly prohibited. Here's a disclaimer that we include in all AIA contract documents education. This presentation and the accompanying materials that you will receive um, are meant for informational purposes only. They are not provided as legal advice. So we do uh, suggest that you contact your own legal counsel. With that, I'm gonna now turn it over to one of our co-presenters to introduce herself. Marika, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Hosti. My name is Marika Snyder, and I am an architect who does um, principally design build in Dayton, Ohio. And I do about 40% of my work is residential and a, a large portion is remodeling. And then I also teach at the University of Memphis. Michael, thank you very much. Bill, I'm both an architect and an attorney. I spent six years of my life as a law student and an attorney. Otherwise, for 30 years, I practiced as a uh, principal of Bell Architecture in New Orleans. My work is almost exclusively residential. As an architect lawyer, I admit to being a bit of a geek about how design and construction interrelate with the law and contracts. Last year, I wrapped up my 13-year tenure on AIA's Documents Committee, which I chaired for two years. And there I worked on all kinds of design and construction contracts. But contracts for residential projects was my primary focus. And I should add that I also was on this committee with Michael, and we worked on the whole suite of residential contracts together as part of a small subgroup. So AIA has published standard documents and forms for it's 135 years now. One of the great things about how we write these documents at AIA is that the stakeholders participate in the process. We have contractors, owners, and of course, architects, not just attorneys participate in writing these documents. And uh, these documents have been over the years interpreted by the courts and they've evolved to reflect the changing world of design and construction, including the greater litigiousness that we see in today's society. And at this point in time, we now have uh, nearly 200 documents and forms. When we uh, write these, we primary objective is, is that we'd like the industry to treat them like a standard. We do allow them to be used, and then we get feedback on how they're used, and uh, we periodically revise them. We, our goal is to be is to have them be fair and balanced between the various parties, and balance the competing interests of the parties, and try to put risk where it's best managed. So we'll talk about um, some of the details and some of the parts of how we manage risk in residential projects. Next slide. So residential remodeling has some specific risks for owners. They care very deeply about their home and it's very personal. And they often live on the site or really visit it quite frequently. And the other challenge um, in risk with re residential remodeling is that clients are often not familiar with the process of construction and it's like they're seeing the sausage being made which is sometimes scary and sometimes really intimidating because we know how th that there's a lot of there's a lot of parts that make up the actual production in remodeling a house and some clients think that perfection is the standard as opposed to the actual standard of care and so sometimes they have unrealistic expectations of performance. There's also risks in residential remodeling that deal with complexity. 
it's always challenging integrating the new construction with the old construction and matching the new to the old. And this is different from working in new construction, residential or commercial. And then there's the challenges of unforeseen um, conditions. For example, I had one project where we had done soils um, testing throughout the site, but when we actually got when we actually started filling the, the foundation, we found a big like sinkhole underneath and had to go back and re-engineer it and pour in a massive amount of concrete to solve that problem. And then residential remodeling is also more complex because there's often a limited use of the site and there can be damage to existing construction very easily. And all these things can result in delays and increased costs and disputes. So um, there's several ways you can deal with risk. You can't avoid all of it, but accepting appropriate risk for the compensation is really the goal. So one of the ways to mitigate the risk is to use insurance, and carrying insurance can help reduce the risk. And then another way is to transfer the risk to the appropriate party. Sometimes um, it's best to have the person or the entity who can control it best to be the one that takes that risk. So we contractually transfer the risk to the owner for providing an accurate survey because the land is their land and they're the ones that can control it. Certainly the builder doesn't have control over the site. And so if, and in that case of um, the problems, the geotechnical problems, the owner was the one that had to um, make a change order um, in order to deal with the fact that the site wasn't as it was expected. And another thing is that if the owner doesn't make timely decisions, that can impact the schedule and the cost. And so the owner should be the one to bear the risk for untimely decisions. So the AI recently published this new document, A113, standard form of agreement between owner and contractor for remodel of a single family home. We developed it specifically for a single family. Um, you can go back to the previous slide, um, Austin, thanks. We developed it specifically for a single family residential remodeling project. And uh, we will take a dive into the A113 and review its major provisions. And in doing so, we hope to illustrate principles of managing risks in these types of projects. In particular, how contract provisions can help to mitigate those risks. Looking here at the title of the A113, I should add a word about agreements. Uh, AIA prefers the kinder and gentler term agreement to a contract, but we'll use contract and agreement interchangeably. They are essentially the same thing. Next slide. So the A113 addresses construction of a remodeling project. It does not address where the design came from. Maybe an architect or draftsman provided it. Uh, maybe the contractor provides it. Maybe the owner sketched it up. The agreement is really designed for a, a simple project. It's not a geared, it's not geared towards a major addition or total renovation or multifamily setting where codes get to be even more of a factor and should be addressed more in the agreement. The contract may seem long at seven pages, but as you'll see, it's uh, important to address in your contract many things. But for a more extensive project, you want an even more robust agreement than what you'll find here in A113. As we develop this document, in my mind, I, I, I hate to put a number on it, but I pictured a $100,000 or so project. And the reason I hate to um, put a number on it is because I should add that you really should consider not only the cost of the project, but also the complexity and, and other risks that may be inherent in this particular project before you choose to use this agreement. AI, we do have more robust agreements for more robust projects, and I will point you to those later in this presentation. But um, this is, uh, as I said, it's a uh, for not a seriously complicated project. Um, 
we've addressed uh, A113 risks that arise in these more modest remodeling projects, and uh, we have addressed eventualities that may never come to pass. But if they do, you want your contract to provide for uh, for what happens in the situation where some of these eventualities arise. Some examples are, of course, changes. Every project has changes. Uh, the discovery of hazardous materials you weren't expecting, um, and I um, hope this doesn't happen, but the possibility of termination by either owner or the contractor. And uh, we'll cover, we'll talk about those and, and discuss several more um, things that need to be covered. Next slide. So in Article 1, I'll walk you through this agreement a little bit. And you can, uh, on the AI's website, view example an example of this agreement. Um, but the uh, I'll walk you through it. Article 1 provides a place to list all that makes up the contract between the owner and the remodeling contractor. And as highlighted here, this agreement, the A113 itself, is the is part of the agreement. Um, any drawings and specifications, uh, there's a place there to list them in Article 1. Uh, changes that changes haven't happened yet in the job as you enter into this agreement. Um, but when they do happen and they're executed and they should be in writing, they become part of this agreement. And then you have a place there for any other documents that, that might be relevant. For example, you may want to include a list of allowances for the selections that are to be made for the project, or uh, you may want to um, reference standards that might be uh, relative to determining the quality of the work that uh, is expected. Next. So um, building a home in some ways is, uh, in several ways, is different than building a commercial structure in terms of the law, it's pretty much accepted public policy from state to state that buyers of homes need special protection when purchasing a home. And these kinds of laws vary widely from state to state. In Louisiana, where I, I live and practice, the New Home Warranty Act is what it's called, and it's the exclusive remedy for aggrieved homeowners who have been working with a contractor. And this law and most such laws require that the home builder notify the owner of this remedy and of the procedures that must be followed in the event of um, a dispute. But um, be careful if you fail to notify the owner of these procedures, as we're providing for you to do here, if you fail to notify the owner of the procedures, you might waive your rights to the defense of claiming that the owner didn't follow uh, proper procedures which can be a valuable defense um, if it's available. Um, Article 1 provides a place to fill in or reference, fill in or reference this, uh, the relevant law. And uh, so you really should, you really need to know what these consumer protection laws are in your just jurisdiction, wherever you're building. So, in a remodeling setting, there are likely some constraints on performing construction tasks, and we, we uh, address those here in this 1.3. For example, you may not have access to the entire home that you're working on. Maybe uh, the owners may be living there. Maybe you have access for only certain hours of the day. Um, they don't want you around when you, when they're, before they go to work and after they come home or the kids come home from school. There may be a requirement that heating and cooling must be operational after uh, after hours, and that can be something you you want to know about ahead of time. Uh, the owner may want you to surgically remove and store uh, an old mantle in the home so that it may be reinstalled later. So it's best to memorialize these points to avoid disputes later, and here's the place to do that. Next. So there's, uh, beyond the owner's requirements, uh, there may be other requirements imposed by outside forces. There may be a homeowners association that may limit the hours that uh, the contractor uh, may work. Uh, there may be historic preservation requirements that don't allow things, certain things like, say, vinyl windows. Um, you want to know about that. 
and you may reference these types of rules here in Article 1, and you may attach them to the agreement if they are lengthy. Next. So should, you should also, contractors owners should also have a discussion about consultants and which ones may be required. Is a surveyor required? Does someone need to be hired to draw a floor plan or more? Uh, do you, you need an engineer to size a beam and sign off on that for the permitting office? So here we have a fill point where the contractors consultants uh, can be named. You also uh, can provide here that the owner is hiring a particular consultant. Next. When we talk about contract time, it seems like a simple concept until you've been through your first project. Uh, and so it's important to um, discuss that. So the way this project has been set up is trying to do this as straightforwardly as possible that the work will commence on this date and be completed on or by whatever the date is. If you would like to choose some other way to write that, but we've, but it seems simpler to put a beginning and an end date. And the important part that I really see here is that in the contract, it says that if the contractor is delayed at any time, um, by changes that were ordered in the work or, or by disputes or fire or unusual delay or discovery of hazardous materials um, or other things that are beyond the contractor's control, the contract time will be adjusted equitably. So there's a provision in there that you're not still stuck with the same end date when something happens, such as if you discover that there's asbestos tape in uh, the drywall of a building that's being demolished, which I've had happen. And that took about an extra two months for the project because we had to have that remediated. So with the contract sum and payments, um, most of these it's expected will be a stipulated cost or sometimes called a lump sum. So you would put the amount um, and then the milestones, perhaps if it's after foundation or dried in or whatever the milestones would be. They can be listed here or if it's a little more complicated and you have your own form, you could just say see attached and attach that on there. You can also fill in the allowances or add an attachment for that. So traditional uh, examples of allowances might be appliances or plumbing fixtures um, because you haven't made selections on those yet and they can dramatically change the price of the project. During COVID, we often saw uh, lumber packages being, used, being specified as an allowance as a way to manage the risk of price escalation. And so it'll be interesting to see if that remains standard uh, practice or if that goes back into the, the standard, the stipulated cost. Um, other assumptions that might be made as a part of this agreement should be listed here. So there's a place to fill them in if there's any exclusions or clarifications. So for example, you might want to clarify that the price does not include the pool, because there's a pool contractor, but it does include the deck around it. Next slide. So the contractor needs to have a certain amount of insurance and there are fill points to list those amounts um, and the coverage for those. There's the general liability, automobile uh, liability, workman's comp, employers, and builder's risk. And builder's risk covers the damage to the work that happens under construction. And there's also a fill point in case there's another specific type of insurance that's required for this individual projects. Uh, please note that in some jurisdiction, the contractors are required to post their insurance coverages and their licensing information online uh, with the governing agency so that the clients can actually look up and ensure that you do have insurance. Next slide. The owner also is required to carry insurance and they need liability that will cover the replacement value of the owner's property that might be damaged or destroyed 
or not otherwise covered in the builder's risk insurance. And this is one of the things that's somewhat unique to remodeling work because it's often done in an existing structure which has contents as well. Next slide. The contractor has certain responsibilities um, which are to, unsurprisingly, do the work as um, specified in, um, in the drawings. And um, the contractor is also the sole entity responsible for safety, for materials and methods. And this is one thing that's important to talk to the clients about because oftentimes, or sometimes clients think that because it's their house, they can tell people what to do or how to do it. But the contractor is the one who knows about the safety and the materials and the methods and is bearing that risk. And so it's important through talking about the, the contract to explain this to as a way to explain it to the owner. Okay, next slide. The warranties, um, it's, it's important to comply with the statutory warranties and also to know what your state's consumer protection laws include. And Michael discussed this briefly previously. Um, and you need to know what you're required to provide and also what notices you need to give to, to people. There are There's a huge variance from state to state. And so that's why it's not in this document. It's, it's essential incumbent upon contractor to know what the legal rules are. So the contractor also warrants that the materials and equipment that are furnished under the contract will be new unless otherwise specified in the contract documents. I do a lot of historic preservation work and so in some cases we will actually specify that the brick is salvaged brick or sometimes we'll get some old growth lumber that we'll use in order to get the right grain. And so in those cases, it's really important to specify that it's not new. But other than that, as you would expect, the equipment and the materials would be new. And the work is free from defects and it conforms to the contract documents. Next slide. So the agreement provides that the contract will pay for the permit and, and associated fees. Uh, and so you can either include this in your price or you can put that as a, an allowance depending on what risk you're taking in your area and how the pricing goes. Um, and so if the inspection falls short, um, this, is, this is a really great way to show that you have um, done all of the elements of the project as you're going through. Okay, next slide. And then the contractor also is required to keep the operations to the site area that they're allowed to be within. And because it is a house, and especially if people are living there, there are a lot of limits. And this is where, we, where that is in the documents. And so the owner um, also needs to provide access to that at the agreed upon times. And um, so some in a project you might like Michael said, it might be limited to daytime hours while people are at work, or there might be special rules about not being making noise between certain hours, especially if you've got covenants in your neighborhood that you can't have work before 7 a.m. or something. And then the contractor will not unreasonably encumber the site with materials or equipment. You still need to be able to use the space and to keep it habitable for the neighborhood. Next slide. <clears throat> so con continuing on with uh, Article 5, which is the, which covers contractor responsibilities, 5.11 provides that the contractor is responsible for making the construction all fit together, including where new meets old. Of course, matching new construction to existing is often part of a remodeling project. Not always, but as it says, we're applicable. You may need to match an existing drywall finish. You may need to feather in new wood flooring to existing wood flooring. Whatever it is, the contractor is responsible for matching the quality, performance, capacity, and finish of existing adjacent structures or finishes. Okay, 
So the contractor, of course, must keep a clean job site. It's not reasonable for an owner to expect the spotless job site every night, but contractors, the contractor must keep the site free from accumulation of debris and trash related to the work. And at the end of the project, the owner can expect to not see things left behind like scrap lumber, bricks, mortar, sand, or whatever the case may be. So the contractor must take reasonable precautions to prevent damage to, of course, people, to the work itself, to the neighbor's property, et cetera. This is all in the contractor's control, so the burden is on the contractor. You know, we talked earlier about how we try to assign risk to where they're best managed. This is an example of that. The contractor uh, um, is in control of the work, so uh, it's, on, it's on the contractor. You know all the ways that people can get hurt on job sites. Uh, don't leave laying around boards of nails sticking out of them, and you should, of course, put temporary railings around stairwells and things like this. The contractor also knows uh, best as to requirements relative to hazardous materials. Accord accordingly, the contractor is responsible for compliance, but the owner is responsible for paying for that compliance. Uh, the, that's where the risk is best put for the cost of it is on the owner, not the contractor who innocently stumbled into hazardous materials. Next slide. So of course, every project always has changes and um, six, article six covers changes in the work. And when the owner and 6.1, it says that when the owner agrees on changes in the work in writing, they become part of the contract documents. We mentioned that earlier, talking about Article 1. But if the cost of the change is an issue between the parties and they just can't agree on it, they can agree to keep moving forward so the project doesn't just stop with the cost calculated as actual cost plus overhead and profit. Um, that's not a that's not a perfect solution, but it's uh, because they can always disagree on what actual costs later. But it's certainly uh, it's preferable to stopping the project. And then in 6.2, um, when surprises are encountered, uh, ones that couldn't be anticipated, the owner bears this risk, and that the contract sum and time are to be adjusted to account for that surprise. Like I said, with relative to hazardous materials, that's an example of that. Next. <clears throat> so the owner's rejection of work is a very difficult topic in this type of project. Uh, undoubtedly, all of you have, uh, contractors have experienced the client with um, unreasonable expectations. There seem to be a lot of them out there. The agreements, this agreement says that the owners may reject work it doesn't conform to the contract documents. But many owners may not really want, know what that means. Um, so when we drafted this uh, document, this A113, we did have a lot of discussions about how to try to place some limits around the owner's right to reject work. Educating the owner about what is reasonable is part of the role of a, an architect when an architect is on a project. Here it's likely just the owner and contractor, and that can lead to harder to resolve disputes. So we added into the A113 the opportunity to cite a reference, uh, I mentioned that in Article 1, a reference to a standard to try to provide some guidance for the contractor to point to in these situations. Some of the examples of guidelines you may reference in the contract, and you probably are familiar with these, are the NHB's NAHB's Residential Construction Performance Guidelines. That document, document covers the performance guidelines for most of the various trades. Much of it is uh, what we call tolerances, but other examples include the, uh, like the six foot rule. If you're standing six feet away from it and you can't see it, it shouldn't be considered a, a non-acceptable blemish um, in the work or a defect in the work. So you can also get more specific and reference publications like the uh, National Wood Flooring Association standards, the Tile Council of North America standards, and there are many others. This may seem unnecessary until you get to know your owner better. 
sadly, there are people out there who just cannot be made to be happy, and uh, you can't always see them coming. So it's a good thing to cover in your contract. Next. So the owner also has a number of responsibilities in this contract. And the first is to provide information about the site and the covenant or conditions or restrictions. The owner needs to give this to the contractor so that you can know what you're agreeing to and also your performance standards, such as like a homeowner's association requirements. Uh, the owner is responsible for giving surveys. Um, and obtaining easements or variances as, um, as they're required. And so it's important to go through this as you're going through the contract to talk with the owner about their responsibilities so that they can provide that for, that for you. And so you'll be protected in case something unforeseen happens or something happens that should have been the owner's responsibility. And so, because this is a document specifically for residential remodeling, we also wanted to make sure to um, say things like the homeowner's requirements or the homeowner's association or covenants. And then also the owner has a responsibility to do this expeditiously, otherwise it will slow down the whole project. If we go to the next slide, we can talk about completion. So, we use the word completion here. Uh, if you work in commercial or in some areas, it's called substantial completion, which is defined as when the work is sufficiently complete for the owner to use. Uh, and so because there's different, that is a way that we found that the owner can understand what completion means. It doesn't mean absolutely done. When it's sufficiently complete that the that the owner could use it, the contractor submits a list of items to be completed or, or a punch list. And then the owner makes an inspection of those items and then the contractor completes them. And when the final payment is due, the owner inspects the work. And so um, this way, it helps give language that works more simply with people who may be less familiar with the construction process, but also to help the clients understand that you'll be substantially complete or well enough that they can move furniture in, but you may have a few little items, like putting the plate on the electrical um, outlet that can be done after that. Next slide. Now, no one really likes to talk about termination or when things go bad, and hopefully that doesn't ever ha happen on a project. But if you work through this in the contract, then there's an understanding of how you can terminate the contract in a way that's the most fair, and both parties receive whatever they're due. So if there is a termination for cause, the owner is entitled to finish the work and then the balance due to the contractor is determined by how much is left of the contract sum and whether or not it costs the owner more or less to finish the work. Next slide. Now the owner can um, treat, the owner can terminate for substantial breach of contract or a substantial breach of contract such as the contractor repeat, repeatedly refuses or fails to supply enough properly skilled workers or proper materials, or if the contractor fails to make payments to the subcontractors for materials or labor in accordance with the respective agreements between the contractor and the subcontractor, or if the contractor repeatedly disregards laws, ordinances, or rules, regulations, orders, or other things, um, or if the contractor is guilty of a, another substantial breach of a provision of the contract. So if there's termination for cause, the owner's entitled, as I just said, to finish the, to have the work finished and then um, find out how much the original contractor has completed and whether or not there's more or less work to be done. But hopefully this does not happen on anyone's project and you can, the act of working through the contract in the beginning helps set up the correct understanding. So this A113 remodeler project uh, contract 
for a not so huge remodeling project is part of a suite of documents that AIA has created for residential projects. And here you have on your screen four other documents that may be relevant to you. The first two have to do with a custom residential project when an architect is to be retained. Typically, we're talking about a more involved project than one for which the A113 is appropriate. The A110, as you can see, is between the owner and contractor, and it assumes an architect is involved. And a B110 is the document between the owner and the architect. These are the two documents that I primarily use in our project, uh, in our projects, because um, being an architect, I'm involved with projects involving architects. Um, the uh, the last two contracts, um, A111 and A112, um, A111 is between the owner and the home builder or contractor. When the design comes from a third party, the A112 is between the owner and the home builder when part of what the owner what the home builder does, home builder or contractor, is to provide the design. Both of these uh, may be used for not just new construction, but for major renovations and additions. They are longer and with a good bit more content than the A113 ha has, and that's appropriate for projects with more scope, complexity, and risk, as we talked about. Those are the factors to look at when you, um, when you decide on your contract. But I'd suggest that you compare the A113 that we've been talking about uh, with, to the good bit longer A111 and see what's been left out of the A113 because it's for a simpler project. Uh, when choosing a contract, one of the big questions to ask is whether you'd like to spell out something um, through the use of a contractual provision rather than having to argue later about what's fair. Using good contracts that are um, as thorough as they need to be for a giving pro given project can have a, a really big impact on your profitability. If something is not spelled out and you run into a, a problem and uh, it, the owner takes a position against you and you could have provided for it in a contract, is, uh, can, you can, it can cost a lot of money. So next. So AIA offers many contracts beyond the ones we've mentioned. AIA also offers project management forms that you've likely seen, including payment applications, the G702 and 703, schedule of values, change orders, certificates of substantial completion, et cetera. There are good ways online to get these forms and contracts. You can obtain a single document where you can edit only the project data and fill in the blanks, so to speak. You can also obtain a single document where you can edit the standard provisions as you see fit. Or if you use a large amount of these documents, you can get an annual subscription where you can obtain and edit whatever you want. So I mentioned comparing the A113 to the more robust A111 and A112 so that you may decide what's appropriate for your project. Um, the AIA contract documents website, you can see samples of these so that you may uh, you may do that. Next slide. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marika and Michael, for taking the time to present on these documents for us today. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come into the, into the chat. Um, before we get to the questions, I did just want to quickly talk about some of the resources we have available at AIA Contract Documents. Again, a reminder that you will receive the recording of today's webinar as well as the PowerPoint. In this PowerPoint, you see there are hyperlinks. Um, we encourage you to visit our Learn page, which has a plethora of resources, articles, videos, uh, guides, newsletters and so forth um, for you on risk management issues as well as our contract documents. We also have help pages that can help you if you have any questions either related to our content or the ACV5 online service platform. Um, we encourage you to uh, follow us on social media. We have a YouTube channel as well as LinkedIn and Facebook accounts. We do um, share content, newly published content 
uh, pretty much on a daily or weekly basis. So if you don't follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, please do. Uh, subscribe to our free monthly newsletter, Construction Risk Brief. This is where uh, we'll provide you a summary of some of our recently published risk management topics, as well as upcoming webinars or on-demand webinars. Any questions that we can't get to today, uh, please feel free to email docinfo at aiacontracts.com. And any questions related to the online service, whether that's purchasing or any te technical support issues, you can email support at aiacontracts.com. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start opening it up for questions. We do have a number that have entered the chat, so let's get started. So we have um, one attendee who would like to hear more about insurance policy limits that the builder needs to carry. Basically how to fill out, I guess, section 4.11, 1, 4.12, 4.14. That, that would uh, be beyond our, uh, our purview or our uh, ability to, uh, to recommend, but I think that, uh, your insurance agent is probably the resource for that. Um, it's not that we don't want to uh, to help you with that. It's just that I, I don't really have the knowledge as to what kind of uh, limits you should carry. But um, I think your insurance agent would be your resource for that. And they may be able to point you to the company itself and resources that they may have. Well, and I'm not exactly sure what the question is asking, but it's not there there aren't sort of industry standard needs for what you have to have you need to it's about dealing with the risk and so you want to have the appropriate insurance for the project or the the projects or the total of the projects you do and again that would be your insurance agent who can help you out to find that and so it's a matter of risk um, and how you mitigate the risk Great, and um, here's another question. This AIA form is for use by the owner and the general contractor. Why is the architect involved in filling out this form? Is the architect involved, Marika or Michael? Okay. No, th this yeah. is this is one. This is assuming there isn't there isn't an architect involved in this contract. There might be a separate contract or something else happening, but it's not a part of this. So just a little background for you know 135 years i think we did the math and saw um the ai has been uh, writing all these documents and the contra the the projects have had an architect involved the ones that we're writing documents for but um we recognize that there are there's a lot of residential construction and remodeling that is done in this uh, country that uh, does not involve an architect and we uh, They've been very good at what we've what we've written, and we wanted to uh, give the industry the benefit of of uh, of well written contracts. That uh, yes, architects are involved in writing them, but they uh, they don't these projects really don't assume that an architect is involved. So um, we really aren't. We, uh, in, in an A one thirteen, chances are there's no architect involved in uh, in writing that. Are, are filling in that contract. Do you recommend including liquidated damages in the contract? I personally am not a, a fan of them. Uh, owners tend to want to put them in there. I think that it it it's just a recipe for conflict. Um, sometimes the owners think, well, uh, the, the fair thing to do is to also put an incentive in there. Um, which would balance that out, but you still are faced with the the tedious accounting of not only money but um, uh, time and money, really. And uh, it's uh, I just find it's a very hard thing to administer, especially with an unsophisticated client like most of your residential remodel clients are going to be. So I would think that I'd say the short answer is we don't recommend liquidated damages. In, in my experience, it sets up an adversarial relationship, and then you should also talk with your lawyer about whether or not they're enforceable, because there's been some case law 
on this um, and whether or not there actually is a liquidated damage. Um, but definitely, yes, ask your lawyer about that um, if you want that to be a so in this part of the contract. Of so in this suite of documents that I, I sort of just went through, the, the various documents, we we very consciously did not provide for a liquidated damages provision, although in the much more complicated uh, AIA documents relative to commercial big commercial projects, there is a there is the opportunity to ins insert a liquidated damages amount, but they're not in these documents. Do you have a recommended contract type for, for a contractor taking over a renovation that a previous contractor had started and then had been fired from? Uh, risks associated with deficiencies created by others. I would say see your lawyer because <laughs> you you the contract can take the same form as one of these that we've been talking about but there are also uh, there are several things that you uh beyond my uh my abilities you need to you want to write in there to to somehow make your you uh, as the as the uh contract taking up picking up the job not responsible for things that were uh, done by the previous contractor and that can be very very complicated. If no LDs, how does the homeowner have leverage to get the remodeler to complete the work? Contingency payment, retainage, this is an area of construction that is fraught with bad actors. <laughs> well, when I talk to owners, I mean, certainly don't pay for work that hasn't been done. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's. I don't disagree with uh, um, with this statement, and uh, it is a it is a uh, a challenge, um, and uh, that's the argument for liquidated damages uh, provisions. Um, we find that, um, yeah, it's it, the argument goes both ways. Um, what the most of the projects that we we do, uh, yes, the owner is living with the project taking longer than the time period which the contract, contract provided for it to take. And there's not much, uh, uh, when it gets, if you got into a dispute, uh, there is a, uh, arguably a breach of sorts there if it, the contractors took two years for something that was supposed to take 16 months. Um, but it's uh that's not a big uh big threat and i find most of our owners are living with uh, are accepting that the contractor is going to take longer to do it than they said they would and uh the um as marika said a, a proving payment uh request is is part of the stick that you have but um it's uh yeah it's a tough issue is there an equivalent of an owner architect agreement of the A113? Is there an equivalent? Yes. Um, but is there an AIA contract similar to A113 that is for the owner architect agreement? No, there's not. There's not. Generally, if you uh, if an architect is involved on in a small project, there are uh, um, there are owner architect agreements that can be used and a, a agreement other than the A113 would be recommended um, that uh, we did say earlier that the, uh, the A110 and the B110 is is the, the tandem that you would usually see when an architect's involved on a remodeling project. And it's not that they can't be used on something very simple. In fact, we do it all the time because we're an architect involved in the project, even if it's a simple project. So I would encourage you to look to the, the B110 and the A110. And, and because those are specific to residential, we also have like the A105, which is a small project, uh, but in many cases 
houses are somewhat complicated, even if they're a lot smaller in size and square footage and in budget, there's a lot going on. And so I would recommend someone look at the, the A and the B110 first before the 105. Thank you, Monica. That, that's a really good point. There's a, uh, AI has a A105 owner contractor agreement and a B105 owner architect agreement, which are for very, very, very simple projects. Um, and uh, they they work in tandem together. And if you look at those, you'll see that, I mean, I think the B105 is two or three pages. That's the owner architect agreement. Sorry about all the acronyms. Uh, I sometimes forget to, to say what the acronyms uh, stand for. But um, the B105 is, as Marika just said, is probably where you would want to go for something simple. If it's a little more complicated, uh, the B110 would be for a residential project where you'd go. So this attendee mentions a communication problem with the client caused contract termination. What is the best procedure to avoid future problems? Is there a, a checklist that we have to run by the client before signing the contract? Well, I think so. One of the one of the other webinars that we do talks about some of the basics and, and the importance of taking the time to walk through the contract and discuss it. And so, in my experience, the contract is valuable because it protects you in case of a legal dispute. But it's actually more valuable when everyone comes together at the beginning and understands what the expectations are and how the game is going to be played. And then that these, the rules and the way we do this is followed throughout the process. And so I don't think we have a checklist, but. No, no checklist, um, but, and then what that usually, what Mike is describing usually takes the form of, you know, what we call a pre-construction meeting. And, uh, and that is an opportunity to uh, list out everything you want to cover about communications and how, you know, whether you're going to meet every week or two, which is a very good practice, and uh, and spell all that out at the um, at the pre-construction meeting. And you can use that opportunity to point to to provisions in the contract that might uh, sometimes part of, as Marika said in his other present other presentations, we do we point out that contracts uh, there are all these things like uh, who's responsible for what, but um, in some sense they can be looked at as a roadmap of sorts about how a project is going to proceed. And so if you sort of sit down, talk through that, how things are going to progress and how communications will be handled, you know, it's a, it's an ounce of prevention after the, uh, understand that after the, after things fall apart and there's a termination because of lack of communication, it's too late, but, um, try to prevent that is there any form of abbreviated text for the use of digital documents available abbreviated what abbreviated text for the use of digital documents available i'm, I'm wondering if they mean abbreviated forms but i'm not sure so the the digital exhibit um yeah, there's yeah, and that may be the thing to point you to. Not 100% sure of uh, the question, but there is something that, uh, as Marika said, called the digital documents exhibit. I believe uh, I don't know the number, but if you if you looked up those words, um, I think you might find it's it's an exhibit which can be attached to an agreement, and it spells out. Um, you know, I think I think in today's I don't, I don't see a lot of big digital models in the projects uh, that that would happen in the projects that we're talking about for this A113. But if you get into things like digital models and sharing the models, and there are, there are a lot of issues with all of that that are sort of behind beyond what an A113 user likely uh, is dealing with. But AI has a lot of uh, material and documents that uh, that address the use of digital data. And, and I, I've shortened it by talking about building information models, but it also applies to all other digital data. Um, even there's provisions regarding emails and, and of course, uh, project websites and things like that. 
use some of those resources that Hasti uh, has put up here. Is there a contract best used with the design build residential project? There are actually uh, um, some documents that Marika and I both worked on. Uh, there's a it's a, the A145 is a res is for residential design build, and it basically um, you know has the sort of design and the construction provisions all in in the same document. So. I would look that up. It's it gets a lot of use. It's very popular. I hope I captured this question as well. Um, can Michael repeat the Nation Residential Construction Standards Organization? <laughs> oh, the NAHB and the Net, uh, the Wood Flooring Council. So and I oh. so I totally jumped in. And it was especially expressed to Michael. The tile council, the American. There's a wood council that also has one, but the national the national National Wood Flooring Association Tile Council of North America. There are plenty of others, but the NAHB National Association of Home Builders. Um, I think that's still the uh, acronym. I know it changed at some point, but uh, there's something called the Residential Construction Performance Guidelines. It's uh, I have a copy on my shelf. It's a handy, uh, handy document to to have around, and you can cite it in your in your agreement. Is there and are there any provisions in this contract for legal costs, attorneys' fees in the event the owner and contractor go to court? I, I can't. Um, I don't think so. I think you know you. As I've said before, you can use uh, you can use a longer contract than you need for anything, um, and I. You know the philosophy behind this is that if it's a little small remodeling project, you just don't. Nobody really wants to throw 20 pages of contract in front of the owner. Um, although sometimes I, you know, advise that that's the best way to go. But this is a short agreement. Some of the things that that were taken out of it so that it sort of seemed in balance with the type of project that we recommend it be used for was the uh, were the dispute resolution provisions. And so it's sort of, you know, uh, in the absence of that, you can go to court or you could both agree to arbitrate, but there's nothing in there that says you must arbitrate. And I, I think that the, the provisions for attorney's fees would, would have uh, are part of those dispute resolution provisions that did not make it into this shorter agreement. Does that sound right, Marika? Yes. I think you might have just answered this next question, but I'll ask nonetheless. Uh, do you suggest any type of dispute resolu resolution be identified in the documents? If, if you important. have a preference, I would. Um, and uh, that's a uh, that's a that's a long discussion. You, you'll get attorneys and uh, architects who've been through uh, disputes, all with various different opinions about. Uh, which one to choose. Um, and of course, you can always agree to mediate before you ever get to arbitration or, um, or litigation, but there's a, it's, it's kind of like liquidated damages. There's a, a lot of different opinions about that. I'd have a tough time uh, without knowing the, the project, uh, saying that you should always go for arbitration or always for litigation. This will be the last question for today. In your experience, are residential owners likely to negotiate these types of contracts? Depends. I would, what's that, Marika? I said it depends. It does. Um, I mentioned earlier I used the A110 and B110 a lot, which are the contractor and architect agreements for custom residential projects. And um, when I talk about the using those agreements um i can tell you that uh, i hardly ever get any pushback um on negotiating uh, on provisions in the agreement you know maybe one out of every 30 or 40 of them will want to change something usually it's something minor um 
and maybe um, uh, or they or one of every 30, 40 may want to turn it over to their attorney just out of abundance of caution to make sure they're not signing anything, which I, I respect that. Um, and then oftentimes attorneys will uh, make themselves uh, feel useful by saying, oh, you need to go for this and this and this. And uh, and personally, not to get too off track here, but I, I keep some provisions that I would like to put in to add to the standard language, um, like a limitation of liability that I don't bring up until the owner says that the uh, a standard form contract put out by the AIA is not uh, good enough for him. Then I'll say, well, these are some things I'd like if you'd like those things. Um, and uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I was just distracted. There were three deer running across my lawn. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I would, uh, I, but my, 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 the bottom line is, is that I honestly, if, there, if it's a standard agreement that's uh, put out by an organization, by AI, I find that it, people see that its intended use is for a project like theirs. And I don't find them looking to negotiate uh, um, very often. Okay, great. Um, well, just a reminder that we will send you the recording and the PowerPoint from today's session by COB tomorrow. If you have any additional questions that we couldn't get to today, please contact docinfo at aiacontracts.com and they will be happy to assist you. Also, please don't forget to check out our learn page. Um, if you go to our website and click resources on the upper right hand side, you will find a plethora of articles, on demand videos, webinars, and more resource resources for you available on this topic and many more. Please also don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, also our YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to thank our presenters for an excellent presentation today and thank you to the audience for great questions. We hope you enjoyed this webinar and we look forward to you attending our next one. Have thank you for attending. Thank you.